Now See It, Person to Person, a weekly document for television, as told by the faces and voices of people in the news. work on this issue with juveniles? It, it, it starts by recognizing that we are the people's police, that we belong to the people we serve. By recognizing that we are the people's police, the people's police, that we are the people's police, that we belong to the people, the people's police, people's police, that we people's police, that we belong to the people's police, that we people's police, that we police, that we belong to the people we serve, people we serve, the people we serve, people we serve, serve, we serve, belong to the people we serve, we serve. It, it, it starts by recognizing that we are the people's police, that we belong to the people we serve. Uh, and and that, that is a major shift in the thinking and ultimately in the behavior of individual police officers as well as entire police agencies. We've sort of adopted over the years this, in part uh, out of collusion with the public that basically let us do it. Just decided, we'll, we'll go to the community meeting, for example, in an area that's being terrorized by uh, predatory street crime series or what have you, and we'll tell the community what we're going to do and when we're going to do it, why we're going to do it, or even if we're going to do it, and if we're going to do it, and if we're going to do it, do it, or even if we're going to do it. And more often than not, we'll say, please be our eyes and ears and take some passive role in this process. And we're really reversing that, the community basically saying to us, we are frightened or we've changed the way we live as a result of these concerns and we want your expertise and your wisdom at the table, but here's what we want you to do. But here's what we want you to do. Here's what we want you to do. Here's what we want you to do. But here's what we want you to do. And we want your expertise and your wisdom at the table, but here's what we want you to do. And that's hard for many of us in this business to take, but that's the essence of policing in a democracy, and especially with your expertise and your wisdom at the table, but here's what we want you to do. And that's hard for many of us in this business to take, but that's the essence of policing in a democracy. That's the essence of policing in a democracy. But that's the essence of policing in a democracy. But that's the essence of policing in a democracy. It's the essence of policing in a democracy. But that's the essence of policing in a democracy. Democracy and especially democracy and democracy and especially democracy and democracy and democracy and especially democracy and a democracy and democracy and the essence of policing in a democracy. That's the essence of policing in a democracy. That's the essence of policing in a democracy. But that's the essence of policing in a democracy. That's the essence of policing in a democracy. It's hard for many of us in this business to take, but that's the essence of policing in a democracy. And that's hard for many of us in this business to take. And that's hard for many of us in this business to take. And that's hard for many of us in this business to take, but that's the essence of policing in a democracy. And that's hard for many of us in this business to take, but that's the essence of policing in a democracy. And that's hard for many of us in this business to take, but that's the essence of policing in a democracy. And that's hard for many of us in this business to take, but that's the essence of policing in a democracy and take some passive role in this process and we're really reversing that the community basically saying to us we are frightened or we've changed the way we live as a result of these concerns and we want your expertise and your wisdom at the table but here's what we want you to do and that's hard for many of us in this business to take but that's the essence of policing in a democracy and especially one yes. 
So you uh, just looked so through um, the receipts. Yeah. Actually, now there is an example. Yeah, Somebody requested that. Say, and that's I'll tell you the a proof. set of Packmire grips. But uh -huh. <coughs> so there's an example of a receipt where they asked they needed a receipt. That was a special order. But yeah, then. So typically you write the receipt only if someone is in fact buying a gun or they or they specifically request a receipt. Or it's a special okay. order. It's okay. something we don't have in stock. Then we write them a receipt so they know we've ordered it. Oh, and you've just looked at the April 2nd receipts and there is no receipt for shotgun shells. And there's no receipt for Kurt Cobain. <laughs> And this is the register receipt that's typically issued if somebody just buys something like shotgun shells and the name of your company is not printed on the receipt. No. that Miss Rossman had disappeared. Well, she has been found. Yes. We are recommending for the report a verdict of suicide. What would be your opinion? I'd have to agree. She was perhaps despondent over the loss of her beloved Mr. Rapan. Yes. <coughs> that would account for it. You are. You're very helpful.
and so uh, this is uh, this is the dark dimension. And I understand you find lots of uh, sort of dark material on the network in this. Uh yes, there's unusual stuff that is coming from this one. Um, they upload to other um, boards, and um, I've never logged on to them. You know that number myself, but. Um yeah. Oh, and let's see that uh, what the description was on that photo. Certainly. So this was uh, originally filed under Cobrain Zip. Cobrain Zip, C O B R A I N E Zip. So that's pretty callous to say. Yes. Begin with, you know. And claimed that it was created on five ten ninety four. Yeah. And it's been up on the network since the nineteenth of May. So for about two weeks, right? I would think so. At least the description, which is usually the last thing created before you upload something. It shows 519, so I would say that's a pretty safe guess. Okay, well, uh, do you have the description, the uh, words that say actual oh, photo? Indeed. Words describing it, yes. And there they are. Oh, this is what you actually saw when you logged on to a bulletin board where this was on, um, it would be under the description part of what was available, what was, you know, dis that describes the actual, yeah. you know, picture. And what it says is, yup, it's an actual picture of what's left of Kurt's head, brains a la mode, bon appetit, the kids will love it. And then, uh, well, let's just uh, take a look at that photo. So okay. it's a pretty callous description, Very too. callous description. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. So it's hard to tell just uh, what exactly that is, but one thing is for sure, it's not the scene of the death of Kurt Cobain. So your understanding is that this probably is the kind of image of a person who died of a shotgun wound to the head, but and that's presumably the chin, right? Uh, that would seem to be a chin because this looks like neck, here where the uh -huh. pointer is. This looks seems to be a bare shoulder. Yeah. And that looks to be a side of the face, and of course, the hair up here. Yeah. So we might assume, and in fact it's probably very reasonable to assume, that this person uh, did die of a shotgun wound, and that's probably where the person who put it on the network got it. You know, it's a pathology text that says shotgun wound to the head. But, uh, of course, <laughs> we know from the photos that have been published of Mr. Cobain's death that uh, oh, hello. there's not a chance in a million that uh, this was actually uh, Kurt Cobain. Yeah. That probably is. I mean, wouldn't you agree that that probably is what the caption in the text said was this was a person who died of a shotgun wound to the head? That would seem assured. Yeah. And as we can both see, even though it's in black and white, it's uh, quite a bloody mess. Yeah. Well, that's interesting, but it sure as heck ain't Kurt Cobain. Not one chance in a billion. Yeah. Well, thanks very much.
to the conspiracy tapes. Our next story begins in Washington at the White House. It involves a mystery surrounding the death of Bill Clinton's best friend and personal lawyer, Vincent Foster. They buried Foster last July. They've been trying to bury the riddle of his death ever since. Officially, it has been ruled a suicide. But we've spoken to some criminal experts, men trained in examining violent deaths, who think the Foster case is much more sinister. It is a sweltering July day in Washington, D.C. At the White House, Vince Foster, right-hand man and lifelong friend of President Clinton, leaves his office for an appointment, an appointment with death. The White House is still in shock tonight after the apparent suicide of Vincent Foster, the deputy White House legal counsel and close personal friend of the Clinton family. There is really no way to know why these things happen. And it is very important that his life not be judged simply by how it ended, because Vince Foster was a wonderful man. Foster's body was found in this lonely Civil War stronghold in Virginia. A bullet wound in his head, a gun in his hand. Official verdict? Suicide. I don't think there is anything more to know. His family, his friends, his co-workers. Uh, we've been up real late two nights in a row now, remembering and crying and laughing and talking about him. I don't think there is anything else. But nearly a year later, Fort Marcy Park is still haunted by Foster's strange death. Caused me to stop from this hectic and challenging adventure I am on in Washington. To think about the roads I traveled to get there. The hectic adventure in Washington proved too much. After a series of attacks by the Wall Street Journal, Vince Foster ended it all, according to the official version. There are far too many unanswered questions. That's completely at this right. Time, it's completely at least right. In the public record to That's even begin to call this a suicide. Absolutely. Absolutely. Former New York police detective Arthur Nascarella learned all about murder on the mean streets of the city. Twenty years of questioning, cajoling, calling, he knows how a violent death investigation should be conducted and how it shouldn't be conducted. You had the park police come in, see the gun in Mr. Force's hand, and immediately call it and treat it as a suicide. All right, that is not good police work. Nascarella, too, scoffs at the official story of suicide. Very fishy, like a large trout in a trunk of your car for about a week. I personally do not believe that it, was a, that it was a suicide. I believe it was a homicide. It's just too clean. It's just too... It's perfect. Okay, it's Hollywood. It's not reality. Nascarella and Wheaton see eye to eye on the holes in the suicide story. Item, the neatness of the crime scene. There was an amazing lack of blood next to his body. There was uh, little or no blood found at the scene, which is extremely uh, uh, difficult to understand. If somebody puts a gun in their mouth and pulls the trigger, they blow their brains out. It's not a pretty scene. Okay, there's a lot of, there's a lot of blood, there's a lot of physical disturbance to the body. I don't have to go into it. You believe me when I tell you. Okay, you, 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 you are n not gonna look well. Item, the gun found in Foster's hand. In 35 years of conducting homicide investigations, I have yet to find a weapon of the caliber of a 38 caliber pistol or larger still in the victim's hands. The gun remaining in the hand after the event uh, is not impossible. Uh, it's, not, it's also not impossible that I might hit a uh, Grand Slam home run in the bottom of the ninth inning in this year's World Series, but it's not likely. Item. The so-called suicide note found torn to pieces in Foster's briefcase almost a week after he died. How they could say they never found it during the first search of a briefcase is absolutely ludicrous because you're not searching a warehouse, you're searching a briefcase. All you have to do is turn it upside down and you found everything in it. No mention of the word suicide on it. Uh, no despondency beyond uh, that which related to the work he was doing, the pressures of the office. Uh, nothing about his family, no goodbye. It, it's not consistent with what goes on. Item, the inexperienced park police investigating the violent death. If I wanted an investigation to be totally screwed up, I would hire the park police to come in and conduct the investigation. I can't think of another group 
that would be more incompetent at doing that kind of work except for the Keystone cops. Questions and more questions.
Hello, I'm Richard Lee. In producing this program, Now See It Person to Person, over the last year or so, and particularly in producing this multi-part series on the death of Kurt Cobain, viewers will probably have noticed a thing or two about the style of the program. While it cannot be said that we never pull punches, we do, after all. Part of the, after all, part of the reporter's task these days is to be a skillful dodger of litigation. We nevertheless have quite a sordid tale to tell in the death, the murder of Kurt Cobain. And we are willing to lay it out in these genre-specific terms. Terms like cover-up, conspiracy, incompetence, gross negligence, moral ineptitude, dereliction of duty, etc., etc., whichever description as the evidence presents itself seems to fit the most clearly. And while we have upon occasion waxed literary and even served up a heapin' helpin' of sociological significance in our introductory comments to the hard facts of this case, and hard, hard are these facts frequently, we have not talked around the implications, we have spelled them out. We have not held back information, we have laid it out. We haven't bluffed or played the cards we hold like a pat hand that will bring us cash or notoriety. We have merely sought to play this thing out in this open forum just to see who might join in in the pursuit of justice for the crimes done to Kurt Cobain. This reporter need not give a rat's arse for positioning himself for the inevitable big, big movie deal coming this way. Don't you get it? See, I'm already a television star. So as you've noticed, the name of this series of programs has tonight been changed from Was Kurt Cobain Murdered? as it was for the previous eight uh, editions of this program. And it is now a considerably less ambiguous Kurt Cobain Was Murdered. If you want me to shout it, I will, if that will get the point across more clearly. If it will help to sing it, I'd be willing to entertain that tack, too. But I'm sure you will agree that I've already done something rather significant in the raising of the ante in the progression of this investigation to spell it out just the way I have. Real nice and clear, Kurt Cobain was murdered. It is not only for attention-grabbing and momentum-propelling purposes that I have made this change. As I stated last week, based on new information that has just developed, I was real tempted to up and rename the program this way as of last week's broadcast. But I was still feeling just an inkling that this might not be quite proper in as much as the evidence was becoming overwhelmingly convincing to me. But after all, I've been on this thing almost daily for two months now. But I had concerns that as far as laying out the details convincingly to you, the follower of these broadcasts, or even the first time viewer, I might fall short of providing you with the single undeniable point of fact that we have all come to know as the so-called smoking gun in these types of investigations. Well, we have our smoking gun now in this case, only the rub is that this particular so-called smoking gun, while it is a gun in fact, it is a gun which clearly belongs in the non-smoking section. Which is not to say that the gun isn't vital evidence, because it is. And it is, therefore, a part of what we can metaphorically call a quote-unquote smoking gun. 
But make no mistake, in the last few weeks of its life, this actual gun was an actual non-smoker. Those of you familiar with the hypothesis from previous week's editions of this program know what I am getting at. This gun of which we speak, a Remington Model 11 20 gauge, didn't kill Kurt Cobain, though it was reported to have been found laying across his chest when the body was discovered, and thus clearly a killer, with a little help from the late Mr. Cobain. But if the gun didn't kill Mr. Cobain, then I'll bet any copper in town dollars to donuts that Mr. Cobain did not kill Mr. Cobain. And I'll bet any copper in town Krugerrands to donuts that the cops on the scene that day walked into the little greenhouse above Cobain's garage and said to themselves just what was stated in our program title tonight. Wow, they all must have said to themselves, Kurt Cobain was murdered. Then they all looked around the room, we can presume, at each other until someone, presumably someone in command, said sad, 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 suicide, sad, sad, suicide, sad, sad, sad case of suicide. And there and then, even by the admission of the chief of police of the city of Seattle, Mr. Norm Stamper, the conclusion of suicide was reached that day. Without his approval, that is, without the approval of the chief of police, or his immediate knowledge, by the way, according to his version of his involvement, or lack thereof, in the investigation, or lack thereof, on that day, April 8th. If anybody had a moment's concern, that is, if any of the police had a moment's concern that there might be oversight of the case, they could have dismissed those concerns without much thought. Oversight from whom, they might think? The police chief? Nope. Not his style. Not really a hands-on kind of guy, you know. The local FBI office? Well, get serious, one might think. If they were ever to get word of this, they'll know that the Seattle Police Department has real stones for taking care of it this way. Those boys at the SPD, they might think, they take care of business. Real operators, you know. They know how to keep a secret. These are the kind of boys that you can count on for real sensitive operations. Say, like, for instance, for raiding card rooms on King Street, as was done by the SPD and the FBI last week, card rooms full of retired Asian gentlemen playing Mahjong. Real cool customers they are, the SPD, in a tense situation like that. And oversight from the local press didn't pose much of a risk either as evidence from the thundering silence on the Cobain death and the controversy surrounding it for the last two months from every corner of the news media. If the local police get their jollies from anything, I'll bet it's from pulling the strings on what the public knows with a little help from their friends in the, in the Seattle News Squad. Local reporters... Well, for their part, they all seem to like, or rather we can at least say most of them seem to have a propensity to like being tied up by the local police. Kind of kinky, huh? One example of how the local news media has presumably unwittingly participated in the cover-up of the murder of Kurt Cobain can be found in what still stands as the premier piece of investigative reporting on the Cobain death, other than this program, of course. The front page story on the May 11th Seattle Times. There are some interesting tidbits of info on the Cobain matter within the story, 
though hardly enough to justify the involvement of probably about half of the reporters who are on the city, uh, the uh, Seattle Times City News Squad, all of whom are credited with contributing to this story. Still, though, we felt at the time that at least the Times had done something to discuss what they called the lingering unanswered questions in the case. On this program, I even paid a compliment to the Times for coming up with disturbing evidence of credit card charges on Kurt Cobain's C-first account after his death, or rather attempts at charges, with very erratic use before his death, strongly indicating that it was stolen around the time that he died. It turns out that perhaps we paid that compliment too freely. While the Times came up with dates, times, and dollar amounts of the attempted charges from Mr. Cobain's account, which had reportedly been canceled from the remote location of California by Mr. Cobain's wife, the adventuresome Courtney Love, the idea, according to a private investigator working with Ms. Love, was that it would be easier to trace Mr. Cobain's moves after he left a California medical facility if the C-First credit card was cancelled. But according to the May 11th Times, quote, as it turned out though, cancelling the card made it more difficult to track Cobain because the bank stopped recording the precise location of attempted charges. It only recorded the category of business and the amount of money that the card holder attempted to charge. End quote. And we might ask, are the reporters at the Seattle Times computer illiterate, or are they just simply dummies? Why would the bank record the date and time and the amount and the type of item attempted purchased without recording the location? This has never made sense to me, and when I called C-First officials, they checked with their fraud division. The fraud division then said, of course a record is kept of the location of an attempted charge from a canceled card. You know, to prevent fraud. This means that with this raw da data, the Homicide Squad could have done, let's face it, a hell of a lot to follow up on this including even possibly finding an ATM photograph of whoever it was that stole Mr. Cobain's card and was even using it on the day that his body was discovered. Imagine that. There could be a photo of the killer or a person involved in a conspiracy to commit murder of Kurt Cobain there could be such a photo out there in the bank records, only nobody bothered to look. Oh well, never mind. The other really tasty bit of info in the Times May 11th story doesn't add up to anything at all either, once it's checked out. In the Times story, they proudly let us know that the last known action of Kurt Cobain other than blowing his head off was to take a taxi cab to a gun shop to buy some shotgun shells. Well, that seemed to prove it, didn't it? He went out to buy the ammo he planned to end his life with. So sad. The only problem, though, is that the folks who work at the gun shop to which Cobain was said to have been driven in the taxi never saw Kurt Cobain. One of the guys who works there at the gun shop, in fact, is a real big fan of Seattle rock, and he always works Saturdays, and he says that he never saw Kurt Cobain in the one-room gun shop. The nearest gun shop on the same street says that they never saw Kurt Cobain either. The Times uh, reporter, who is the co-author of the May 11th story, says that they just went ahead and took the Seattle Police Department's word for it when they printed as fact, quote, a receipt for the ammunition was later found at Cobain's house. The Times never saw any receipt. 
and they never went to the gun shops either. Otherwise, they would know that the first store mentioned gives the to- gives a blank sort of receipt for shotgun ammunition. That is, there's no indication as to where the receipt came from. They don't print the name of the shop on the receipt, nor do they print that it was shotgun ammunition. And the second store gives a similar receipt. The Times didn't ask, and say the gun dealers, neither did the police. They didn't come around asking. If Cobain had screamed and hollered that he needed a, needed a written receipt for tax purposes or some such thing, each shop would have written one, but shop number one checked its records and no such receipt is on file, and shop number two says it simply did not happen there. I guess the Times reporter just thought it would be real impolite to check out the Homicide Squad's details. After all, you can't imagine cops actually lying about something, can you? The Seattle Times reporters might have been thinking. But why didn't it even cross the minds of those at the Times that the police could have made a mistake? Hmm. Nah, never mind. Perhaps they too thought. But the crux of the biscuit on all of this is that it really doesn't matter because the cover-up of the murder of Kurt Cobain has fallen apart at its base. Those of you who saw last week's program know that we aired, for the first time ever seen, last week the exclusive video of the scene of the discovery of the body of Kurt Cobain in his above-garage greenhouse on April 8th. This footage, which we have also shown tonight, gives an angle never before seen and confirms what should have been obvious since that day due to a number of clues, including other photographs less dramatic than this video. The official version of the story was that Mr. Cobain blew his brains out but that there was, for an unexplained reason, no pool of blood, at least to the right side of the body, as evidenced in the photos published uh, by the Seattle Times on April 8th and April 9th. The official explaining away of this unusual evidence was capsulized neatly for me in an interview on May 24th with Dr. Nicholas Hartshorn, the King County Medical Examiner pathologist, who certified Mr. Cobain's death a suicide on April 9th. Said Dr. Hartshorn, quote, I'm not confirming or denying anything. I'm just saying that you didn't, you don't have any idea of what was around that head. Now, of course, since I discovered the new video a few days later, we can all see all around the head of the body, and it contradicts sharply what Hartshorn was trying to put across, that all the blood and gore had gone to the left of the body and we just couldn't see. Well, now we do see all around the head, and there's no gore and not a drop of blood around the head. Completely unexplainable. Dr. Hartshorn also dropped an astonishing hint of things to come when he stated that this injury sustained by Cobain, which he had indicated was just a quote-unquote classic shotgun wound to the head injury, was not, as indicated in the death certificate, a quote-unquote perforating shotgun wound through the mouth, but rather a quote-unquote penetrating wound. Penetrating wound, I asked, what's that? Hartshorn explained that penetrating wound, quote, penetrating wound, meaning everything stayed inside the skull. Inside the skull, this was quite incredible. I asked Hartshorn if this meant that he would change the death certificate he signed, which said, quote-unquote, perforating shotgun wound to the head. At first he said it didn't say that, I was wrong, and then he shuffled some papers and said, okay, it does say that. 
He then threatened that he would consider it liable if I reported that he misremembered the wound as penetrating inside the skull only. And then we found and aired the video. I can't be sure, but someone seems to have informed the King County Medical Examiner's office about the content of my program last Wednesday. The next day, I finally got in contact with the King County Medical Examiner, Dr. Donald Ray, who in fact has just been involved in preparing a report in Washington, D.C. on the Vince Foster death for the Whitewater Special Prosecutor, which reportedly confirms the suicide verdict on Foster. And perhaps because of our new video, Dr. Donald T. Ray is now signing on with the magic bullet theory, or at least he is at least verbally signing on with the magic bullet theory, about how Kurt Cobain blew his brains out without blowing his head off. In a very brief and rather turgid interview, Dr. Ray, our very own King County Medical Examiner, that is, the head of that office, responded affirmatively that all of the shot from when Cobain allegedly put that big-barreled shotgun in his mouth to kill himself, that all of the shots stayed inside Mr. Cobain's skull and that there was no exit wound. The next day, Captain Larry Farrar, the head of the Seattle Police Department Homicide Squad, vigorously, enthusiastically, and rather colorfully endorsed the no exit wound explanation. So to all appearances, undoubtedly, the magic bullet theory, or the magic shotgun blast theory, is now the official version of how Kurt Cobain died. Shot himself in the head, no exit wound, from perhaps the most powerful weapon that a civilian can buy, a big bore shotgun, slightly outranked by uh, the 16 gauge and the 12 gauge shotguns, the, the largest of which is only about 15 to 20 percent larger in bore size. So this is now the official version of events. In fact, Larry Farrar, Captain Farrar, head of Homicide, even claims to have seen an x-ray of Kurt Cobain's skull that proves how this is possible. Well, Captain Farrar, I sure would like to see that x-ray, and I'll bet that every pathologist and criminal investigator in the world would like to see that x-ray too. Because, you see, there are no known cases of what you're describing ever having happened to a human head before. If human heads were made that way, we wouldn't need motorcycle helmets. And in battle zones, we could count on shrapnel just bouncing away from our noggins harmlessly. And the idea that this no-exit wound theory is completely implausible has been endorsed in interviews I've had with a 30-year veteran of uh, the Los Angeles County Coroner's Department who says that this is an impossible scenario, that the idea that this could happen is just not within the realm of possibility. Underlining that, I had a conversation with uh, Dr. Cyril Wecht, who is perhaps the leading forensic pathologist in the United States, or is at least one of the leading forensic pathologists, and Dr. Cyril Wecht informed me that the no-exit wound scenario is virtually impossible. Dr. Wecht allowed me to, has endorsed the idea of my quoting him as saying that this is virtually impossible. And yet, only uh, the previous week, uh, Dr. Hartshorn of the medical examiner's office was trying to put it across to me that this was the classic version of the wound, no exit wound. Although the, the fact is that this has probably never happened and probably never will happen with a 20 gauge shotgun wound to the mouth, to the head. The answer to all of the contradictions here seems to reside in the secrecy of government functions. If you're looking for an explanation, anybody in the government can get away with anything 
if they feel confident enough that they are shielded with antique laws guaranteeing complete secrecy and protected as so often they are, as indeed in this case they are, by a press squad that seems to kind of like it that way, since it cuts down on details that need to be checked. And, uh, for example, uh, it is quite apparent that Seattle's finest on the press squad seems to have little ability in the area of detail-oriented work. Given that they would never seem to check any of these details they're given from the police, or they certainly haven't in this case. Tomorrow, we will see a big, big ceremony saluting the death of a Seattle narcotics detective who died on Saturday, Antonio Terry. There will be plenty of pomp and circumstance, we assume, and the mayor and police chief have already rather conspicuously seized on this opportunity to forward their agendas of gun control and a demand for more respect for the police or possibly even more fear of the police, as symbolized by the black electrical tape over badge numbers, a uh, symbolic uh, 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 effort that even the chief of police is participating in, which is hardly a benign symbol, the covering of badge numbers. No one seems uh, too concerned, well, just to, just to emphasize what that means, it seems to rather emphasize an us and them perspective on policing, which I thought that uh, Stamper was uh, all against. Anyway, uh, the, the most important thing is that no one seems too concerned with the nasty hands-on business of why a healthy young man like Terry died by bleeding to death in a hospital. Bleeding to death with a very small caliber bullet wound, a single wound, as reports have stated, to the lower to the lower side abdomen. To all appearances, an eminently survivable injury. And Terry was taken to the hospital uh, conscious and alert, according to uh, police witnesses. And so we must ask ourselves, in a nation where the president's best friend might possibly have been murdered, in a nation where Kurt Cobain was murdered, and it is very difficult to ask any questions at all. For instance, Dr. Wecht informed me that there's never been any release of the Foster autopsy report. We find that there is very little assume, reason to assume that Detective Terry died of a small bullet wound alone. There may have been negligence, there may have been mistakes. It's conceivable that it was unavoidable, but we will never know because the whole process of people dying mysteriously in this country and in this city, or let us say in too many locations in this country, the whole process of people dying mysteriously is cloaked in secrecy. And this is put across that it's uh, to protect the privacy of the people who have died mysteriously. The privacy issue hardly seems to apply to Kurt Cobain. He's dead, and his death was not adjudicated. And so the fact that it is cloaked in secrecy seems to be a travesty of justice. And if the privacy... Uh, or secrecy issue alone does not demonstrate a travesty of justice. Certainly, what has happened in the Kurt Cobain investigation or lack thereof certainly does demonstrate the problem with giving these government officials complete authority to conduct homicide investi investigations in complete secrecy. Not only do common citizens like Kurt Cobain suffer, but even their own seem to be suffering this uh, rather difficult problem of dying in secrecy with no medical explanation offered to the public as to why these persons die. A very significant problem. People dying mysteriously is, of course, a hallmark of the most oppressive regimes. It's something that we hardly should welcome here in Seattle or in the United States. 
I don't know about you, but I certainly hope it's not me who's next. <laughs> and if that seems a bit dramatic, certainly the dramatic circumstances which we're describing make it fit to discuss this in such dramatic terms. In any case, we will bring you an update. This is an open-ended investigation. It airs Wednesdays at 11, and as I rather vigorously emphasized earlier in the program, as much as we can, we are trying to let the facts hang out in this case, which certainly, if anyone knows anything out there in the press, or among those who knew Kurt Cobain, uh, they are certainly not following a similar pursuit in an effort to provide justice to the case of the death, the murder of Kurt Cobain. So please join me again next week.